Uh, the Meyer Berger Award honors distinguished reporting in the tradition of the great New York Times reporter, Meyer Mike Berger. Berger is still famous for a story about an unemployed World War II veteran who one day in 1949 fired his Luger pistol into his quiet neighborhood in Camden, New Jersey, killing 13 people. Berger took the first train to Camden, spent six hours interviewing 50 witnesses, and then went back to the office to write a 4,000 word story in just two and a half hours. Basically, he did an entire master's project in about nine hours. <laughs> Berger would go on to win a Pulitzer Prize for that story. Berger was also known as the master of the human interest story, like the one about the blind man who miscounted his steps on the subway platform and fell in front of the train or the woman who amassed a collection of half a million wishbones from various kinds of poultry. They were stories that focused on the dramas and quirks and struggles of everyday life and ordinary people. Columbia University is proud to present Terrence McCoy of the Washington Post with the Mike Berger Award for his richly drawn portraits of Americans ensnared in the most vexing political and social issues of our day. By gaining access to a subject's most private moments, McCoy gives us stories that go against the conventional narrative. A heartsick grandmother struggling to understand her white supremacist grandson. A disabled truck driver desperately seeking relief for his op opioid addiction. A Catholic priest conjuring mercy as he visits his brother priest in jail. And the mother of a young woman murdered by an undocumented immigrant who finds courage and grace as she grieves. McCoy gives them a voice, and for us, a window into their torment. His immersive reporting is the finest example of how storytelling helps us understand our complex world. Terry is unable to be here today, and so Sidney Trent, Terry's editor on the series, will be accepting the award on his behalf. Okay, good morning. It's a delight to be here. Uh, my name is Sydney Trent, and I'm social issues editor at the Washington Post, and I'm also Terry McCoy's editor. Uh, he couldn't be here today because he is about to become uh, the Washington Post's next Brazil correspondent, and uh, he's busy uh, preparing to leave the country in about 10 days now. Uh, but we have worked extremely closely together over the last four years and to the point where I feel like I can almost channel him, you know. Um, so I can tell you that we're particularly thrilled and humbled that Terry has received the Mike Berger Award for his work because we know it honors the kind of journalism that puts people at the center. That's been Terry's passion as a narrative writer over the last several years. As his editor, I can tell you that Terry is a force of nature. In his ability to find original angles on the big stories of the day and to locate just the right people to tell them. But I think that he would agree that we owe a debt of gratitude to those who allowed Terry into their lives at their most vulnerable moments, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks sometimes over the course of months, often at considerable risk on a number of levels. Apparently, these people were not paying attention to all of the fake news talk. Kenyon Stort, the trucker in Washington State, might have worried that he'd be portrayed as simply another addict when Terry accompanied him on a desperate day-long drive to get an opioid prescription for, this, for his pain from the only doctor he could find who would give him one. But he allowed Terry to come along anyway. Laura Calderwood, whose daughter Molly Tibbetts was killed by an undocumented farm worker, was already familiar with the kind of vitriol 
she could incur when she invited Terry into her home to observe her motherly relationship with a teenage boy who had become friendly with her daughter's murderer. But she brought Terry into her life anyway. And Sam Musser's mother and grandmother were already anguished and embarrassed when Terry sought them out to better understand how even seemingly regular American families can produce white nationalists. Yet, they said yes anyway. Terry and the Washington Post, and in fact all journalists, rely on the willingness of people like these to put their trust in us to fully and accurately tell their stories. Without that faith, our work could not exist. This award belongs to them too. Thank you very much from both of us. And now to present the uh, Paul Tabankin Memorial Award, I'd like to welcome Professor Elena Cabral to the microphone. Good morning. My name is Elena Cabral, and I am a member of the faculty. I run the part-time program, and I'm also a graduate of the MS uh, program myself. I'm so proud to present the Paul Tabankin Memorial Award, which honors the late New York Herald Tribune reporter and recognizes outstanding achievements in reporting on racial or religious hatred, intolerance, or discrimination in the United States. Just a few obscure, under the radar subjects, right? Seriously though, you know, this award means so much to many of us who support and depend on social justice reporting to cast a mirror on this complex and deeply divided country and uh, illuminate a shared experience that affects all of us. And I really strongly encourage all of you students um, who I know are curious and interested in these subjects to submit your work um, that, uh, for this award um, in the next year that you are uh, working in, in newsrooms and, and every year after that because sometimes these are stories that just land in your lap um, but that end up making a huge difference. Um, Columbia is very pleased to present ProPublica's Ginger Thompson, Michael Gravel, and Topher Sanders with the Topankin Prize for their exceptional work documenting, documenting the desperately cruel practice of family separation at the U.S.-Mexico border. Their reporting demonstrated just how vulnerable arriving asylum seekers and migrants are and how children in particular face the gravest dangers whether it be physical, sexual, or emotional violence. ProPublica's brave and dogged reporting on this issue sparked moral outrage and a much needed national conversation about migration and family separations. It's precisely this kind of urgent, rigorous journalism that presents the best of our profession. Here to accept the award are Michael Gravel, uh, Ginger Thompson, and two-time winner, Topher Sanders. Thank you, Elena, for those kind words, and thank you to Columbia University. Um, and I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my colleagues, Ginger and Topher, uh, for, and, and the team at ProPublica that uh, put this project together. Um, Topher won this award last year, as you heard, so we decided we weren't, we weren't gonna have him bore you again this year. 
Instead, I'm going to bore you. Um, uh, so to start, uh, we're of course indebted to our editors Tracy Weber and Alex Zayas, and to Steve Engelberg, Robin Fields, Dick Tofel, Paul Steiger, and everyone else at ProPublica for creating a place where we could do this kind of work. I want to begin with a story about a group of immigrants and a journalist who had come to interview them. One by one, the immigrants told the journalist about why they had decided to put their children's, children in harm's way and bring their families to the United States. They told the journalists of massacres and how thousands of refugees would do almost anything to get their families over here. Looking for our motives, one man hissed in reply to the visitor's questions. I left my hometown soon after a massacre a little over a year ago. During the three days which the massacre lasted, we hid ourselves in a basement. Once a child began to scream just as a party of thugs were passing by the street. The mother sought to quiet it, but it was no use. Another moment and the party would have been on our trail through the cries of the baby. The father of the child then took it in his arms and pressed its face to his breast. It became quiet. When the savage crowd dispersed and the father sought to recall a smile on the baby's lips, his efforts were in vain. The child was dead, suffocated. During the moment of suspense in which the father was waiting for the crowd to move on, he forgot that he was holding a living being in his arms. He pressed it to his breast with such ferocity that it was smothered. It is memories like these that cause us to disregard the health and welfare of our children and send them, to help save the life of the sisters, brothers, and mothers who are still within reach of the murderers and plunderers. The year was 1907. The immigrants weren't from Central America, but from Eastern Europe, and the journalist was Elias Tobankin. While other journalists were, sitting, were writing about slums, Tobankin embedded himself on the west side of Chicago and listened, giving the immigrants space to be heard in the city's newspapers. While others were opining about how this crop of immigrants was somehow morally different from America's previous immigrants, how they'd never be able to assimilate, Tobankin challenged the institutions that failed to help them and that then tried to close the door on them. Tobankin was an immigrant himself who had fled the poverty, instability, and bigotry of Russia as a teenager in the 1890s, arriving here in what today we might call a family unit. Uh, Tobankin's son, Paul, continued his father's work, writing about the coal miners and laborers and the religious bigotry and racism in the early part of the civil rights era. So we are deeply honored and humbled to receive an award that Elias Tobankin helped establish to honor his son's memory. There's perhaps no more meaningful award uh, to the work that we're being honored for today. This series of stories began with the voices of immigrant children, specifically children who just been separated from their parents at the border. Uh, by now, we've all heard the tape that Ginger obtained. It played at the White House, on the floor of Congress, and at demonstrations across the country. And within 48 hours, President Trump signed an executive order instructing agents to stop separating children from their families. At ProPublica, we had the same reaction that others had. It's hard to listen to that tape and even breathe. And so people from across the newsroom stopped what they were doing, put their own projects on hold, and pitched in. Several reporters helped, helped Topher and me file requests for police reports to expose sex assaults and other abuse in the facilities where these children were being held. The research and news apps team created a map to tell the public where the shelters were. And our engagement team worked to gather tips and reunite families that wrote in looking for lost loved ones. And when we asked people in the newsroom why they did it, the answer was simple. How could I be working on anything else? As Elias Tobankin did a little over 100 years ago, we made the decision from the beginning that our stories would be focused on the experiences and voices of those affected by government actions and by government inaction. Later in life, Elias Tobankin became a, uh, uh, a writer of books, a novelist, and he garnered some fame, and someone asked him to reflect on his time as a reporter, and he said this, my reporting experience unsealed for me the book of life, and it is a wonderful book. I went around among the South Clark Street lodging houses, talked to dope fiends and down and outers, and I invariably found that each one of them had a heart and feelings and was human. You sometimes had to look way deep down for his humanity, 
But if you look down deep, if you search for it, you found it. No, newspaper work has not made me cynical. What do I try to put into my books? The heart of men and of women, their aspirations and their dreams. Nothing else matters. As you embark on your journalism careers, I want to urge you to look for the people that no one is talking to. Open your notebook and listen. Finally, in journalism, we talk a lot about uh, pursuing the truth and overcoming adversity to get at it, but we all know that the fight to expose an injustice is nothing compared to the people we write about and their fight to survive that injustice. So we accept this award in honor of Jimena, Wilder, Brian, Josari, Yemerly, Alex, and Amaury, and for the thousands of kids whose names we still don't know and may never know. We promise that this award will not be a trophy to something we did in the past, but a constant reminder of the work that we should be doing and of what journalism can do. Thank you very much, and congratulations, graduates. <laughs>